Welcome to the Last Beer Show. What's up, Jason? Hey, Wayne. Welcome back. Hey, thanks. Glad to be back. It's been a few weeks. It has been a few weeks. Tell me, what have you had lately? Uh, actually, I've been on a me kick lately, which is kind of weird because uh, uh, obviously uh, this is about beer and uh, we drink a lot of beer, but I've been on a huge mead kick. Uh, I tried meads probably a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. I was in San Francisco, uh, did a, a food and culinary tour in San Francisco, and they took us to a meadery up there uh, on the coastline. And the mead that I had was, uh, I'll just say super sweet, super sugary, sweet, honey mead. There wasn't really a whole lot of um, anything to it. It was like orange blossom mead. And I thought, okay, this is fine. It's kind of not my thing because it was ridiculously sweet. But then uh, a friend introduced me to Shram's Mead, which is a mead made up in Michigan. And um, it was a mead made with uh, cherries and, uh, and, and mead. So it's basically like half cherries and half mead. And I was just like blown away by it. It's incredibly rich and jammy and syrupy sweet. And so I've been drinking a lot of meads lately. Superstition Meadery just came to Atlanta to our area, they make a, um, a, f- a fascinating me called peanut butter and jelly crime, which is made with uh, actual, you know, the PB2 powder. And then they use uh, grape. I think they use grapes to yeah. do the jelly and, and then mead and then the honey wine. And so they've just come to our area. So we've been dr- drinking a lot of so those meads. have been geeking out on the mead. Yeah. I've only had a few, not terribly familiar. Uh, and it's been a hit or miss experience, I would yeah. say. So I'm trying to be fair. Yeah, honestly, uh, like uh, it, I was boosted by the uh, Frederickstall appearance at Shelton Fest this year because uh, I went to Shelton Fest. They had this, they call it a cherry, they call it a cherry wine. Uh, Frederickstall, for those who don't know, is a, is a um, they are a, I would say they are a winemaker out of Denmark. And uh, they were at Shelton Fest this year, which was in Atlanta. And uh, honestly, I could I stayed at that table for the most part. It was uh, their cherry wine is made with some proprietary cherries that they grow there. Uh, it's rich, it is syrupy, sweet, lush, uh, incredibly a lot of depth. Right. Uh, and I stayed at that table for the most of Shelton Fest at fourteen percent alcohol. Uh, <laughs> it was honestly, if I got drunk at all, it was from that. That explains table. the stories that you know you've shared. Yeah. It's now now we have some back. Oh, I have some, some stories. Color I have some other stories to so, tell too with some other some local brewery owners who right. are standing at that table and drinking too much and talking about other things. But uh Frederick Stahl and their cherry wine really kind of boosted me into this idea of these um kind of these fruited uh meads and cherry right. type wines. Back to your curiosity. Yeah. Uh it was a good pause from all these New England IPAs that we've been drinking. And I, and actually we, I think that it, we've talked a lot about this, about the trend moving yeah, we've, towards we've lagers and lighter beers and pilsners and things like that. I think there's some, definitely some new England IPA fatigue. Well, after all those sweet IPAs, it's nice to drink something a little drier like mead. Agreed. Right. <laughs> so exactly. this is a bit of a special episode. Very special. We are in the bottle cellar at the Porter beer bar in Atlanta. And for those who love beer travel, when you come to Atlanta, this is one of the best places to visit. Uh, as a beer destination. I think it's one of the best beer destinations in the country. I think it's I one think of the best beer some, destinations in the world, honestly. Uh, I mean, it's really, really incredible, and uh, I'm really grateful that they gave us this opportunity to... Yeah, we, to you to and I have been here. here for about 10 of the last 24 hours. Yeah. We, <laughs> so I think we live here now. I've been so having those my mail two voices, We've got so, squatters, right? Yeah. Those two I, voices I'm are... I'm where I could put a bed in here. We're in the cellar. Literally, we we're surrounded by yeah, just thousands of bottles. Sleeping bag on the I table. Think that'd be fine. I think we've adjusted the median temperature in here yeah. up probably a couple of degrees to which they wouldn't be terribly comfortable, but... Uh, yeah, we have special guests. Special guests. Yeah, special guests. From Good Bear Hunting, we've got Michael Kaiser founder and creative director. And we've got Austin L. Ray. Yep. Welcome, guys. Editorial director. I really yeah. appreciate you guys. Thanks for having us. Glad yeah, I'm psyched about this. Yeah. I'm a huge I'm a huge fan of, uh, of Michael Kaiser and Good Beer Hunting. Uh, and Agreed. The, the work that, that they do in craft beer and just in general, and then also the work that they do around coffee beers. And we talked about the uppers and downers, yeah. which, I, I, again, I've been a fan of uh, since inception. And then uh, I've been a fan of um, kind of quietly, I've been a fanboy of Austin 
uh, since his time at uh, Paste, actually. Right. And um, but he's uh, been following your career. I actually I? have. I've been Austin's a subscriber of his email things. newsletter. I always see him like around corners. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Austin's actually an incredible writer. Uh, Austin, uh, I think there are two people that come to my mind that came out of that whole Paste scene that that are just incredible writers. Uh, that's Austin Ray and Gray Chapman. Mm. And, oh, man. Uh, Love Gray. Yeah. I have mass respect for both of those folks, and so it's a pleasure having Austin here. And also, it's a pleasure having Austin, who is a local a part of the the larger craft beer scene in general. Obviously, a lot of people know Reed Ramsey, who has Beer Street Journal, but um, but Austin is taking you know beer journalism to you know to a different level with what he's doing with Good Beer Hunting, and and he happens to live here in Atlanta, and we run into each other at things, so it's a pleasure. Well, you're too here. kind. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's nice uh, to have media coverage that is handling the subject matter with grace instead of it just being photography porn or porn, you know, some sort of... Don't talk shit about my photography. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. No, I, like no, I love the photography on the set. We used, to get, we used to get complaints about us being a photo blog. I think some of the... It goes back a ways. Well... <laughs> We have a lot of photos Today, in those people's defense. Sorry, that's just one of many hangups I'm going to have before you finish this <laughs> sentence. <laughs> you should just continue. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks for having us on. Yeah. yeah, man. I mean, we're super excited to do this. Uh, and we've got a lot that we want to want to ask you about. And nothing should be too prickly. So, um, But, you know, Jason, this was Jason's idea. He really wanted to have you guys. And I said, no way. They're not going to come on. He yeah, said, I mean, yeah, I, they will. And he texted sure me. we would. Yeah, he well, told yeah, me the next we, day, he's like, I got him. Oh, yeah, it's, man, <laughs> awesome. I mean, who doesn't, who doesn't love to talk about beer for an hour or more and just sit and drink beer and talk about beer? Right. It's it's what, what we'd be doing anyway. There's just exactly. microphones it's not, on. So. It's not a horrible thing. <laughs> right. So, uh, Michael, take us back to, like, let's provide some context for goodbearhunting.com uh, and and the, the publication as a whole and how you came into that a little bit about your history got you there and and what led into it. Yeah. So I guess starting with the end state that we have now, we're kind of a three-legged stool of uh, the dot-com, which is pretty much what Austin runs. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the events and experiences, which is what my wife, Hillary Schuster, runs. And then we have the branding studio, uh, which, I, which is what I run as creative director with designers and illustrators. Those three pieces that exist now, going all the way back, it started from just a really crappy Tumblr blog. Um, like it was just me talking about places I went and things I found and stuff I thought was cool. Awesome. Uh, and then, you know, my skills as a designer and photographer and writer, I think made it seem more interesting than it maybe even was at the time. Um, just cause it looked better than most things out there. Right. Right. Um, but that was just, you know, a particular set of skills that I happen to have as an individual that I kind of planted a different, it planted a seed for a very different kind of tree, uh, that it's grown into now. You know, it doesn't look like a typical trade magazine. It doesn't look like a blog. Like it does all these different things that most places, you know, most journalism outlets don't do. Mm -hmm. uh, it just it, it's it's followed from my very personal skill set and inspiration and interests, and we just kind of keep following that. And along the way, I meet people like Austin. What, how long has it been now? Three years? Yeah, I think a two, longer, two and a half years yeah. of like, yeah, doing all the editing stuff. I just meet people along the way that. like Austin that like they feel like they get it and they appreciate it for what it is and they like that it's different than the other things that are out there and. Then they add this whole another layer of skill sets and experiences and ideas into it. And right. you kind of just like carve out some space and let them run with it and support them. And then it just turns into another whole thing. And so, right. I don't know, it's a very organic kind of growth thing based off of individuals' inspiration. Yeah, there's a lot of different types of content. The, the Fervent Few stuff, the site Yeah, lines. that's pretty new. And I like how it's all kind of, while it's divided, it adds, it creates the this depth. Even if something is fairly new like the Fervent Few, there's this perception of depth because you've got it almost each section is designed differently mm -hmm. and it, it serves the content appropriately rather than trying to jam it all into the same maybe template. Yeah, so sure. when you get to each segment of the site, you, you know, you're kind of reading something different as different flavor. You, and it changes your expectations. Yeah, that's good. I'm glad that's working. Yeah. That's really good to hear that. We like wonder sometimes how much of our categorization is for us and how much other people appreciate it or don't, or, right. you know, like, do they care? Are you aware? Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Well, stuff. I'm a creative guy. So, uh, what happens with the, you know, someone who isn't and just gets to it and goes, the pictures aren't the same size. I don't know what to read. Then I can't help them. I actually also like the fact that there's like, there's multiple levels of different types of digestible content too. Right. So there's the B roll stuff. Which oh, one I, of my favorite things. I, yeah. I love mm -hmm. those because they're incredibly quick snippets it's so of light something that's really cool. They capture a moment of time. Like I remember Blake tires, 
the one mm-hmm. that Blake did of like I think he was cleaning out um, a, um, a brew thing, and um, uh, the one that was posted yesterday I think that you did. Uh, these are really cool, quick snippets of oh, something. Was that the that was the green flash? Yeah, the moment, the green yeah. flash moment. That which, was funny. Um, it's cool because you you almost expect more when you read it because your mind is thinking this is going to be a, a long read, mm-hmm. and then it's done, and you're like, oh, that was cool. Actually, it was like a <laughs> you really scroll quick and there's moment. just one more sentence, right? Yeah, I mean, sometimes a, a short little thing is more memorable for that reason. You're going to walk around all day with it in your head, which I really love. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, I, and I absolutely love the Fervent View stuff. Oh, and awesome. I love it because obviously it's like the voice of the people. It's, yeah, it's, right. um, it's putting other people kind of and their ideas out there because uh, as someone who works in the industry, I'm always curious about what other people are thinking and what, what they're saying, what they're dealing with. Uh, and that the Fervent Few stuff is incredibly fascinating because you get a broader picture of what's going on in craft beer in general. I always yeah. think it feels like a little focus group. Yeah, I agree um, with you. And it is a focus group. Without like, mm-hmm. without like the the other side of like the comment section like it's usually like <laughs> well, it's pretty, not, pretty civil and it's people being like i like the thought but i want to add something you yeah. know instead yeah, of being absolutely. like no fuck you it's like it's like in between the science of mm-hmm. doing some kind of focus group testing and you know comments yeah. which are just a shit show most yeah. of the time so yep. yeah, the, it, i mean it, it, i think it's important to realize that it's a self-selecting group though i mean these are people that are Big enough fans of good beer hunting for whatever they think it is Mm -hmm. that they're willing to pay to be a part of this membership group. And, you know, they get plenty in return for that. But one of the best pieces that we give them is the connection to each other through the Slack channel that we have. And and so I think there's something to be said of, you know, in in this world now where everything on the Internet is free and nothing costs you anything and there are no consequences to your opinions. Right. Like we see that play out to this like in this like terrible direction right (laughs) but then when you know when somebody throws down five bucks a month to be a part of something all of a sudden like their brains shift towards valuing that thing well they're invested they're invested Mm -hmm. uh and i think that changes the way in which they want to express themselves and you know the other people's opinions in there aren't annoying to you that's what you're paying for Mm -hmm. you're paying to hear what other people have to say and i think that just changes the whole dynamic and what we're getting out of that is just really thoughtful like uh personal kind of opinions on things that aren't being seen as the right or wrong opinion right it's somewhere in between like actual human interaction and say the comments or or, you know anonymous reddit accounts where you know all of our ideas like they're they're checked by interaction interactions what we really think about things are checked constantly by interacting with other people and and things and ideas so the more that we get kind of the the more information we have about what we think about something. And then when you're not getting a lot of that, like you're just anonymously, you know, fireballing and spitballing, yeah. you just get a disaster. We go out of our way on there too, to like help people introduce themselves. Like there's a whole channel on there called introduce yourself where people go in and like, like this is why I started reading good beer hunting. And this is why I joined. This is where I live. These are my favorite breweries. And so like, even providing that little bit of introduction, people get a context for your opinions going forward. Like if you're, you know, if you're somebody from Texas and Jester King's your jam and like, these are the things you think about, and you're also like super into loggers right now. Right. Like your opinions going forward are colored in a very helpful way by me knowing where you're coming from. Right. Um, you're not just railing against self distribution, like in as some abstract form. <laughs> you know, like it's like, well, Texas is going to be different than Georgia, you know, which is different than Illinois. And like didn't, now I get why you have that opinion. Didn't I read? I mean, a couple of guys came down pretty hard on distributors. <laughs> there was a, oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, distribution is still maybe the piece it's that gets prickly, the most. Right? like the most controversial i think largely because it's still so complicated and mm. because of that it's the least understood part of the beer world for a lot of folks and consumers don't see it yeah we tend to paint right. distributors with a really right. broad brush you know and state to state they are literally operating in basically different countries you know like right. what they're allowed to do is fundamentally different uh so yeah I, th- I still think distribution is just like the hardest nut to crack in beer is it the next one to kind of open up a little bit I mean, we're seeing it happen already. The business models are shifting as laws allow for it. And we're seeing different kinds of people get into it for different reasons. You know, they're not necessarily trying to grow something. They're trying to meet a need and meet it well. And Mm -hmm. the latest podcast episode we had with Colin McDonald from Hen House, he's a brewery owner and he also runs a small distributorship where, you know, he has three or four other brands in his house. And like, he sees that as the future of distribution in the Bay Area, which is fascinating. That Um, jibes with the franchise laws? It does there. Wow. He's lucky. <laughs> That's why it's such a, it's so difficult to have unique, opinions yeah. on distribution. Yeah, well, self-distribution is a good idea until you have to put it in a lot of places. And then all of a sudden. And then a bar, a beer buyer, you know, <laughs> some place like the border has to meet 40 people on a day right. uh, yeah. instead of four distributors. Yeah. It becomes complicated. Yeah, it doesn't scale well. Yeah. Well, well, we have two, two opening up here in Atlanta, right? 
We have Sab- I have no well, idea. Well, we have self distrib two self distributed breweries. We well, have uh, Sabbath. Brewery. Yeah, they can't self distribute, but yeah, they're, they're, they're I think they're planning not to distribute. Yeah, yeah. Guess, they're yeah, in house service only. In house service mm-hmm. only, right? Yeah, exactly. yeah we take out. So they don't they don't have to fool with that whole model, and they don't they don't want to give control over. And I actually talked to the guys. Uh, uh, I talked to Yoren uh, uh, and uh, Sean Bainbridge, who mm-hmm. are opening up a brewery mm-hmm. here, where they're gonna only kind of you know they're only going to sell beer out of their location and uh you know their 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 idea behind it was you know once we sell it and hand it to a distributor we have no control over sure. it whatsoever from a quality perspective it could take them a month to get it into the consumer's hands and you're right. giving up the possibility of a seven or eight x margin on it that's exactly right. right and so for them they were like we we want to kind of keep that in you know mm-hmm. they'll, they'll have kegs here and there but mm-hmm. um but that's a fascinating thing that is able to happen in georgia now that wasn't able to happen before and i understand that texas just changed their laws i think texas actually mm-hmm. just became a lot more constricted yeah they went backwards with their laws a month ago i guess it was yes and no it really depends on what part of the tier you're looking at that from for craft brewers uh they were given a lot more flexibility in terms of the the cap that was put on them for you know they're allowed to they're allowed to sell a lot more beer through their tap rooms right now but there's a cap put on it that was kind of like kind of pulled it back a little bit but it's still a cap that was like more than any brewer in the state other than like oscar blues was ever going to imagine hitting Hmm. and so but what it did was it didn't really hurt their business in the near term it what it does is it hurts the ultimate valuation on that business because of the amount it can grow so your business is fundamentally worth less in the long term so if you're looking at refinancing or giving pride equity or you know you want to finance through a bank on you know your possibilities in the future like they've been they've been marked down a little bit because of that but that's only after they've been marked way up because of the ability for tap rooms to happen. So it's very complicated as to who yeah. wins and loses on so these things. Complex. Like there's so so many weird ways to look at it. Yeah, I think North Carolina has been battling this cap issue for oh, yeah. a while as well. And uh, you know, a lot of them, their cap is really small. Mm-hmm. And so they're they're at a spot where some of them are like, you know, we can't even really afford to be in business because what happens is people like them and they want to they they have to expand and get bigger and they just they can't because of the caps it's not just expansion i we did a round table yesterday with uh brian purcell from three taverns nick Mm -hmm. purdy from uh wild heaven uh we had nancy palmer from the guild and then we had uh bob from wrecking bar Mm -hmm. on talking about the different ways in which that law that was passed in georgia back in september has had an impact on their business almost every one of them is now making beers on a small batch level that they otherwise would have had no economic yeah, we, capability of yeah, making. We, yeah, we didn't have direct sales until yeah. September here direct in Direct sales the state makes of Georgia, it possible so, to make yeah, so a they, single batch of beer and sell it all in an hour. They had to make flagship beers. They had yeah. to. So this beer that I just opened, actually, and this is not an advertisement for Jekyll oh, Brewing, but the go. beer that I just opened, Secret Apollo, actually came out from a small batch. Mm-hmm. And it came out because as of, as of September 1st, breweries could start making a lot more uh, small batch beers that they could sell in their in their tap room. Because right. if you were to push that through a wholesaler, it would, it would just explode the number of SKUs in their book and it would just be a pain in the plus ass. Plus it's a $4 can, 16 ounce can. And this, this in a Kroger or a Publix is probably going to sit there. Because that's probably not the audience for not this. The price for point this that they yeah. want. Yeah, exactly. Not a four dollar can, and so this can is actually a result of that, and it became a production thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, we have twenty six beers on tap right now, and I would say uh, sixteen of those are tap room only, small batch, one Man, barrel 26. batches, twenty six <laughs> on at yeah. all time, and they're all just one barrel batches. So what's cool about it is that. Some beers like this one, the Secret Apollo, which is uh, sort of a, a New England IPA, fluffy IPA, um, you can test the market and see what's going to work and what's not going to work for your audience. And what works, obviously, you can look at p- possibly doing something more with. And what doesn't work, it can be banished into some sort of mm-hmm. you know, beer hell, if you will. Mm. But it's allowed brewers to experiment and to try and a lot of things, whereas they couldn't do before. And, you know, beers like um, I like, uh, actually almost brought it. It's, it's just so... It's so heavy, but uh, Morning Smack from Three Taverns, which oh, is uh, yeah. probably one was of the best. Is that that maple one? brown ale? Yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. There were so many words on that menu. I couldn't do it. <laughs> it's a that maple, banana, bacon, bacon uh, coffee. Uh, <laughs> it, it sounds like it's messy. It's not. It's no, amazing. people were raving about it. It's I just, amazing. It's delicious. But uh, honestly. need to do some push-ups before that one or something. I don't know. It's one of the best beers to come out of this area in quite a while, and um, that beer wouldn't have even existed it was, probably. It was really, it for September 1st. really good for hair of the dog the other morning. Mm, I bet. Yeah. Or it would have been a thing that some you get like three ounces of on a tour. 
So it's just like mm-hmm. lumped in with like the pile of beer that you're drinking. You right, know? exactly. It like becomes a more special thing. Yeah, so I, I actually, I, I look forward to hearing that conversation because I know what it's been like for us. And honestly, as as a consumer, you know, we can go to breweries that are here locally and taste and try beers that we wouldn't have been, had access to before. Yeah. I remember specifically going to... Um, to uh, a very popular local brewery, which I won't name, um, but a local brewery for a release. And after drinking the release beer, um, I went to to get another beer, and it was basically all the beers that they have in the grocery store. And I was just kind of like, eh, I'm, I'm, I am I'm, guess I'm done. Not interested. I'm pretty good, yeah. you know. And now you go to that brewery, and they have, you know, they have 10 other beers that are on draft. Right. And so what's really exploded is is the barrel programs. Like when they can, yeah. now they can invest in aging and in, mm-hmm. in doing different types of things like souring and wild. Want to get into that? Good article on that last week. Was that last week? Earlier this week. Uh, that was late last week. Late last week. Yep. So, Brian Rothby's. Um, yeah. I mean, I had somebody roll their eyes when I said sour recently. Huh. Anyway, it's a, oh, don't say sour. It's a loaded word. It is. Yeah, it sure. is. No so, one knows what it means. But like now they can experiment with different types of yeast and things that they wouldn't normally have been able to. Have you guys been to Orpheus with the barrel bar that they put in? I thought that was really cool. I haven't been there in about six months. Yeah. Like since since September 1st when the direct sales happened, they put in like a bar that's just like seven taps and it's all like weird barrel stuff because they feel like they can sell it at an interesting price point there. Right. And it's not like. They're, it's not going to sit on a shelf somewhere. It's like being appreciated more. They can talk about it. Yeah, I mean, it, all that wraps up into un, an understanding whereby the beers, some of the most popular styles of beer that are being made now, more sought after stuff, require a different business model in order for it to exist. Yeah. It can't go through the same, you know, pseudo cold chain, sit on a warm shelf at Kroger kind of scenario and be expected to fight for its life alongside loggers that are good for 120 days. Like, it's mm-hmm. just, those are an old system for an old way of going about making beer. Uh, the way you buy and sell a product is just as important to the production of that product. Uh, Correct. So it requires a different system. Yeah. And uh, we're starting to see the cracks in that, making that possible now. Yeah. yeah. Well, some of these things, certainly uh, the New England IPA trend has shown that shelf stability varies a great deal. Sure. Actually, and didn't we just run into an issue with that, with uh, old, what is it, old, um, the M43 beer? Yeah. Oh, boy. Which is... Uh, That's on shelves all over in supermarkets in Michigan right now, and... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, in Michigan. So they just came here to Georgia as a part of this uh, this uh, Day of the Juice Festival, which was a festival put on by a local distributor, um, Modern mm-hmm. Hops. And uh, as of that, um, they brought some of these beers to Atlanta's market, which we don't normally have access to, like M43, which is a phenomenal beer. And I've had to bring um, beers into the Georgia market for special events before, like Uppers and Downers. And yeah. it takes too long to get them through the system for something like that to hold up well. Like to get something registered into a distributor, and then get it to an account takes too long. So, so what happened with the well, M43 at that event? Yeah, so what happened was they they brought the cans uh, into the city, and I guess because it took so long for them to get here from the distributor, um, it it had sat in, in the distributor's um, space for too long, and some of the some of the pallets or some of the boxes of cases had gotten wet and stuff, and so they were having some issues. And so they actually pulled pulled all of the cans and said, "Hey, like, don't sell any of these cans. Like, we're gonna wow. we're gonna ship you a fresh shipment of M43." What an expense! Because you know that was their first. You know they wanted their first impression right. to be something you know spectacular, not something that's just been sitting. And uh, yeah, like you said, it this requires a completely different model, both from a brewery perspective to a distributor you know Mm -hmm. a brewery has to say okay we're gonna like for these beers in particular um this brewery um uh, which shall remain unnamed they actually can it the day of the release and they they can it the day of the release and they only can a, a small amount of it at one time and that's not to create some sort of like fictional um, demand is just so that whatever is out there is fresh. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not putting out like a hundred barrels of this stuff because you know it's just going to sit on a shelf somewhere. Mm-hmm. Right. But I don't think barrel aged beers have that challenge though. No, no. I those are very shelf stable. Mm-hmm. We're in a room full of shelf stable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, we are shelf sta- shelf stable product. The well, walls you have to find that shelf too. We're sitting about on a bunch of shelves in like 55, 60 degree right room that's temperature controlled. True. Yeah. It's a very different kind of shelf. They don't have very any sunlight hitting shelf. them. And yeah. yeah. Uh, so along those lines, like that article on um, the sour vernacular. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was the first in our series 
it's a new series called Into the Wild, which is one of our underwriter series, New Belgium's mm -hmm. underwriting that one. Right. And then uh, that was by Brian Roth. Yeah, I thought it was really great. And it was funny. I had just had someone, like I said, roll their eyes at me for using the word sour. Yeah. When they're wild. I was like, okay, all right. <laughs> I'll back up here and give you the floor. But, uh, and you know the guy, but I'm not saying who. No, so uh, <laughs> so um, has that, has there been any kind of uh, friction or activity around that article uh, either way? Not friction. I mean, most people are saying like, yeah, this is a big deal. Like this is a big problem that we haven't solved yet. And this right. goes back for us for a ways. This is a new idea. Like we, going back to CBC back in Philly, we hosted a conference um, with a couple of folks from New Belgium, including Lauren Salazar. Uh, we had, um, Brandon Jones from Yazoo embrace the funk there. Mm -hmm. Um, we had some folks from rare barrel, like we had a, a panel discussion in a room full of a couple hundred people. Uh, and we called it sour on sour. And it was basically the idea that like this term sour is and is not working at the same time. Right. You know, like it's, yeah, it's attracted a certain amount of people who are interested in that flavor, um, but it's not necessarily appealing to people beyond that or preparing for them for the experience of these beers or educating them on how they're made or doing any of the work that we need the vocabulary right. to do. Uh, and so we had a great conversation then about um, different people's experiences of trying to sell these beers. Like what kind of language do you use on a menu? Like how do you pitch them on a package? Uh, even, you know, using words like funky are kind of falling out of favor too, you know? Like yeah, it's not always going to work for everyone. Yeah, and so, yeah. and it's and it's tough because, you know, somebody's saying it's not sour, it's wild. It's like, well, that only that's only true if it's an actually a wild ale. Right. You can have sour beers that are not wild at all. Uh, and so this is really difficult. And that doesn't help. I think, like, there's the people who, when they hear sour, they're like, ugh. Yeah. Like, I don't, like, you think about, like, puckering, like, that right. sounds bad. Well, you came up, you know, eating Sour Patch Kids as right. a kid, and it was purposefully supposed to be this grotesque yeah. thing, yeah. but it was cartoonized. And right. Yeah. And some of those beers are cartoonized, frankly. <laughs> I mean, with their acid profiles. Some of them, you've seen um, it, yeah. You get so, I don't know. One of the things heartburn. that I thought Brian did a good job in the article of was outlining how uh, the wine world seems to be having a moment with uh, a much simpler version of the vocabulary with either raw or natural wines. Um, people seem to be glomming onto that as like there's an inherent virtue to the word natural, right? Hmm. That sour doesn't have. Um, wild doesn't necessarily have, but it could. It gets right. a little bit closer. But the idea that something's natural and thereby a little bit more passive in the way that it's made, it's a little, a little bit more like connected to the earth or rhythms. Or, I mean, they used to use terms like biodynamic, you know, right. and everybody was like, what the fuck? That sounds like witchcraft. Yeah, I'm not okay. interested. <laughs> and that didn't go anywhere. Yeah. You know, and all nobody that wants to see Britannomyces on the billboard. Now. Certainly not. But natural seems to be doing work for the wine world. And yeah. so some of us are starting to wonder like, ah, can we, you know, can we slingshot that into the sour yeah, wild ale that. area? Uh, that gets really interesting, but also immediately problematic also because there's always these yeah buts, you know? Um, but it's an interesting thing to look at different segments, different kinds of beverages and figuring out how people are attracted to the same kind of principles. Right. Um, just using a different And the lawsuits start flying in from natural light. <laughs> <laughs> that, this, kind of, this kind of reminds me of the I'll, conversation. Is from, Natty Light going to blow up? I didn't <laughs> even think about that. <laughs> just residual sales from the indirect <laughs> effect of a... Much better than the regular light. From the lexicon yeah. <laughs> shift in craft beer. Natty Light's trending. Well, this reminds me of the conversation that you guys had, uh, the uh, the Fodor for Thought. Yeah, big uh, time. Which I listened to, and uh, it was really fascinating. The guys from Green Bench and mm -hmm. a couple of, the, of those other guys who – do these kind of sour beers and how uh, how Green Bench was, you know, how hard it was for them to kind of market these beers in, yeah. an, in a market where they weren't really doing it. Now you look at it and you have beers like Cycle and uh, Arcane who are doing these crazy Ber Florida Berliner Vices with yeah. like that are green and now they don't have any issues with that kind of stuff at all. But well, they still have issues selling a lot of that down there. Um, that's a big problem. I mean, Florida is still as much as it is up and coming, like trying to sell a bunch of wild ales down there at the price points required to, to barrel ferment these things or barrel age them or whatever is still a challenge. That's why, uh, people like Greenbench are still putting their stuff out through Shelton to get it into, you know, urban markets where there's a bunch of people who are looking for these beers. Hmm. Um, so it hasn't really, it hasn't rectified itself in terms of local sales, but there's definitely more people interested in those things than ever before, which is nice, but it's like anywhere. It's a, it's a slow incremental audience growth. Yeah. Yeah. I think that we've definitely seen that with Orpheus here. Uh, Orpheus is a local brewery here in Atlanta and they started out mainly just mainly doing sours and kind of barrel aged stuff. And, you know, the, it took a while for people to get and understand what it is that they do and why they do it, you know? And so. But somebody like Chris Johnson, uh, Chris Johnson, not a green bench, I think is, 
he recognized it early on that this was going to be a challenge to build that audience. And he went about becoming an ambassador for the category. And like, mm-hmm. so creating food or for thought this event for him is about bringing in all these other producers, some of the best he can find some that he would openly admit are way better than him. Uh, he would bring them and pour their beers for that audience. Cause in his mind, if he can create an audience that's seeking these things out and knows what they're supposed to be and they're excited about it, yeah, they have it then. Yeah. Then you're going to come back to green bench and you're going to drink these beers. So I don't have to send them all over the country instead. Yeah. So, uh, this will be a good segue because we were talking about Brian Roth and, uh, obviously Brian Roth was kind of the author of the, um, kind of a controversial, uh, story that you guys ran a little bit mm-hmm. earlier, a couple months ago, I guess, has it been a couple months? It's yeah, seems couple like, months. Yeah, it was yeah, late February, months. wasn't yeah, it? That's right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Seems like it's been a couple months, and and honestly, the 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 story was was kind of on, um, mm. uh, you know, just some things that uh, folks at breweries uh, do uh, uh, that have a misogynist kind of bent to them, and uh, you know, there were some there were some folks who work at breweries around the country who had created some accounts, uh, mainly on Instagram, just mainly to have fun, but probably didn't think it through all the mm-hmm. way and they didn't think it through of who would see that and how it would connect to their to their uh beer brand on the whole uh what was the do you what was the name of that one bros uh i know what boys like mm-hmm. i know what boys like that's yeah. what it was and uh it was a really uh obviously it was a real challenging and meaty i i, I like to say, i i said i had to digest it i just had to sure. chew on it a while mm-hmm. because there was so much to that it's article. Detailed article it was incredibly too. detailed and um, not easily palatable meaning that it was heavy and like you really needed to think about this through and i think that um uh, you know, a lot of the the repercussion of it that was negative was from people that that didn't, didn't actually digest it and didn't actually chew mm-hmm. on it, and and so um, I like to just talk about that yeah, because sure. we were talking about Brian Roth who had written this article about sour right, beers, yeah. and um, you know Brian was even though Good Beer Hunting on the whole took the brunt of that, Brian was the author, and not to mm-hmm. not to lay blame on Brian but, and to mm-hmm. separate, but um, but. Obviously, it's uh, something that you guys uh, saw as a as an important thing, right? Yeah, I mean, going back a few years now, like this was, I don't know, maybe the tenth piece we've published. The, so we write a lot of articles about beer culture and about what's going on around the product of beer. And that's always been sort of like what we were interested in. Uh, and going back a few years now, I think was the the first time uh, I think I wrote it was the uh, was a piece about misogyny on beer labels and racism in beer labels. This is going back a little ways now, um, and that piece was mostly met with you know, some appreciation, uh, although there were plenty of people who came out of the woodwork like, oh, snowflake can't handle these terrible labels, you know, and that kind of thing. So we, you know, we've been writing about this kind of part of the beer world for a while, especially as it relates to craft. Um, <clears throat> craft seems to have a very unique relationship with racism and misogyny. Uh, and it's odd to people who think about it as being more community driven. And so those two things being, I think, contrasting makes it very strangely heightened uh, in the craft world, because we don't expect to find that sort of thing here. Um, so, but so going back a few years, like this is a kind of this is the kind of thing we've been writing for a long time, uh, and we started a category called humanity and hospitality this year specifically to address things like sexual harassment, misogyny, racism, um, based around the idea that or the insight that craft brewers are now moving into the hospitality realm. So, <clears throat> there's a huge difference between having a, man, a small manufacturing environment like a craft brewery. And having a bit of a boys club in the back, you know, in the, in the factory setting, um, which is terrible, but somewhat expected uh, as things go like that. And that's true of any industry that's manufacturing to some degree. And then moving into the taproom realm where you're essentially operating a restaurant or a bar. And most people who are operating small craft breweries do not realize the threshold you cross when you end up in a hospitality environment. And a woman who lives above Good Beer Hunting Studio in Logan Square in Chicago really inspired us with... Uh, she came down to talk to us about some of the things that she was working on. She runs a she runs a company devoted to help called Healing to Action. Uh, her name is Shireen, devoted to helping uh, people who have suffered from sexual violence or intimidation in the workplace. Seventy percent of all cases reported to the federal government that fall into that category come from the hospitality industry. Mm. Wow, it's astonishing. Is, yeah. yeah. And when she started opening our eyes to this thing that we already cared about from a cultural aspect within craft beer, but didn't necessarily connect it to the kinds of businesses the craft breweries were going to become and how threatening that environment could be just from a pure, you know, historical analysis standpoint, 
uh, I was shocked. I mean, we, you know, on the, on the creative side, we develop and launch brewery brands and we help design tap rooms and we work with hiring staff and things like that. Never once had it occurred to us that these were dangerous environments, but the numbers showed me that they are, and we just don't talk about it. We don't uncover it. We don't know what it looks like. We don't know how it happens that way. Uh, so we started, we started a category of stories called humanity and hospitality devoted to that subject entirely. Uh, we did a podcast with a panel discussion with three different women's groups that, that investigate and help people within those environments. So that kicked off the series, got a little bit of attention. Uh, then we've published a couple more articles following up on that that kind of outlined why we were investigating that area, why it meant that to us, how craft brewers should be thinking about these things in a lot more depth and awareness. Uh, got a little bit of attention. But when something different happened when we didn't just talk about these things in an academic way. We didn't just talk about them in the abstract. We didn't just go out and say, we should not have racist beer labels and we should treat people better in craft breweries. Right. We went out and showed examples in very explicit celebratory ways of how people are unwittingly or on purpose contributing to these environments through the celebration of white maleness in those environments in a way that is offensive in some cases. In other ways, it's very benign but still adds up to a culture of exclusion. Uh, and we were trying to make the case, as we have with this entire category going back to the beginning, that a culture of exclusion begins with the benign things. And that opens the door to enabling all these other things to feel normal, to just feel like jokes, to just feel like a boys club, what's the big deal? They, you know, it happens to be that way, it's not intentional. That culture of exclusion begins with those smallest pieces. Ultimately, that's what ends up with somebody in a tap room you know, getting groped and feeling like they can't do anything about it or being in the back working on beer one night and feeling really nervous that it's just them and one other dude in the brew house that day. Those things are what create a hostile environment. So when Brian Roth took a run at that article and he was, he was working on that thing for a couple of months where he was, he was trying to look at a, the culture of inclusion and exclusion through the lens of the BA's diversity program turning one year old. He was asking himself and the BA, the Brewers Association, like what's happened in the last year that we've pushed forward on how have we progressed. And he has, you know, Scott Metzger, who was the chair of the diversity committee at the time, was in the article saying, we might not be able to do much about this. You know, we're going to try, we're going to try our best, but it's a big problem and it's hard to figure out how to solve it. Uh, and that was sort of the article that was coming. And then when we, when we stumbled onto these boys club accounts on Instagram that didn't just happen to show a little bit too much boys club kind of fun, but in some ways we're celebrating it. And some of them were extreme. Uh, I think that was, that was the moment where we're like, yeah, this is not an academic article anymore. Like we're going to point to the things that we think are contributing wholeheartedly to this hostile environment. And that's what blew up ultimately. Yeah. It's uh, it's interesting. And I say it's interesting because uh, obviously uh, as a podcast, uh, whenever Wayne and I first got together and we talked about like what, what were the things that we were going to talk about, we just we were like, we don't really want to talk about things that everybody else is talking about. Like we want to talk about things that people aren't talking about. And some of that in involved like controversial issues. So sure. this year alone, uh, we talked about uh, women in craft beer. We've uh, had an a, a podcast version with uh, African Americans in craft beer. Uh, we had a, a local disabled guy who is in craft beer. He has multiple sclerosis. Yeah, we had guests on all those episodes. That yeah, we had yeah we had guests, and um, you know the, most of them work for local breweries. And we just mm -hmm. asked them what what their experience was, honestly, so we could Wayne and I could learn, so yep. we could communicate that to other people. Uh, we know that there's a problem because we're we're white males and we we've heard it enough that we know that there's a problem, but honestly, just to hear them talk about it from their perspective. And we told them, listen, we don't really want to talk a lot. We just want to listen. Um, it was right. incredibly fascinating and eye opening as to what really goes down or what it really looks like to enter a craft brewery tap room as an African American person. Right. Or, you know, in some cases, you know, we've got one of our, one of our best local brewer brewers here is an African American a woman who is also, so gay and um, man I can't even remotely fathom what that experience is like for her but to hear her kind of share that experience was incredibly eye-opening so we, we we like that's to where we that whenever we heard matter. that from yeah. you guys we were like hey we, like, yeah. well, it sounds like you were in a position to be like you were looking to digest that article right yeah like we were, there was we were something already, there for you <laughs> well yeah. we already had uh, a series of content that allowed us to naturally talk about the article yeah and, yeah. and provide an opinion on it because we had already gone down that road and, and other roads. Now, we hadn't exposed any, you know, bro life hashtag, you know, 
Instagram accounts, but we definitely, because, you know, we're not journalists, but we had that history, so it was very easy for us to do it. And when we did it, I only had a few people come out and be like, I don't know, flame us on the on the Twitter. Mm. Really, that was really the only place that we caught a little bit of flack for what we had said. Um, but, you know, we published it and we pinged you because we were like, look, these guys are getting hammered. Mm-hmm. Let's stick up for them. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> let's like so, say, no, this is a on conversation mm-hmm. because as white males, we're really the only ones that can make meaningful contribution to the change in this kind of activity or attitude or culture. Because we control it for the most part. Exactly. Right? We wrote the rules. Yeah. And, and, and it's, not, it's not a fair thing. No, but let's no, be honest. it's not like, about we're, that. We're the, we're the key effectors of change in this scenario. So when, when we saw that article yeah, and we knew that direction that you guys were taking in terms of hospitality, we were like, Yeah, you can't that's, leave that's change. That's exactly right. The, Positive change in culturally can't be left on a marginalized group alone to solve. Right. It's not gonna it's not gonna work that way. Related to that, like the thing that kind of killed me about we got obviously a lot of criticism about the article, but there were people who it was all focused on the Instagram stuff. And like they acted like there wasn't like two thirds of the rest of an article that talked about like what black people face and right. what women face. What and it's not like the, the, with the their Instagram voices. part was we had people be like, Oh, it would have been cool if you had quoted women. And I'm like, two thirds of the story quotes women. It dude. was like, yeah. there were women in there. Like you didn't get past and the they Instagram part. On like, Instagram, they were in the brewery. Right. Yeah. Instagram so, was a so, window. It's yeah. just weird to see like the, when the people zeroed in, like how much they missed on parts right. of it. And I was like, that's frustrating. And well, that's what I meant by the not digesting it. Like, I think really think you needed to like read that article several times and then really kind of digest it and sit on right. it. And, and honestly, uh, these conversations are never going to be easy. They're always going to be painful. We talked about They're it in great hard. depth before we even did the, the ones that we did on women in craft beer and African Americans craft beer. We thought like, Hey, what do we even ask? Like what, I, I, honestly, we were just like, we're going to open it up and hear their right. story because we knew that it could be incredibly painful for some person, right? And, right. and honestly, we were just like, we, we still need to do it. We need and to have this conversation. And that's why I thought it was, while painful to watch the, the kind of falling out, I guess, that happened on social media uh, in, in, in terms of people, I won't say falling out, but in terms of the backlash from people, um, yeah, yeah, it needed to happen, to oh, be honest. And, and, and- that's exactly how we still feel about it, mm-hmm. um, thankfully, because I ran the number. I did some back of the envelope math, I think, after week one, where I, I kind of counted up or estimated the number of people who were angry about it. And I ran those numbers against the number of people who had read it uh, based on the analytics that we had. And I think it ended up being like a half of a percent of people so were small. angry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There was like, it looks noisy. But when you look at Twitter right. and you look at Facebook, yeah, right. it looks like everybody right. hated it. Right. Uh, what you don't see is the thousands and thousands of people within week one that had been read 15, 16,000 times. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, you don't see the thousands of people reading this thing, emailing it to their friends saying, you need to read this. You need to read or this. emailing um, us or saying, emailing I want to be like, I want to write something. I have a yeah, story. The next to six tell. pieces oh, that came out in that that's series fantastic. came out as a direct result mm-hmm. of somebody recognizing their plight in that article and saying, I have a story to tell too. Right. Yeah. And they wanted to add to that story. Yeah. And that was astonishing for and us. And those have been right. great too, actually. Those and, have been really and, good. And let's not forget, those are people who saw how terrible it was online for us and still said, put my name on the door. Yeah. Add right. my name to this. That's Like, great. I'm ready to do this. What would you say is the most, um, the kind of misconstrued. The misconstrued thing that kind of came out of that article for you? What do you think most people yeah, really there was missed a, about that? Some people thought it was written really quickly in a rush for a scandal, uh, or they thought it was written in this way that was like secretive and looking for clicks. Uh, what those people do not understand is that Brian Roth has been writing about authenticity and inclusion uh, for years now. Uh, he's also he's been applying uh, for grants to write a book about this subject uh, uh, in a much broader sense. It's just something that weighs on him personally. It's something that he's kind of picked up as like a thing that he wants to make a difference in. He's brought voices to our podcast platform that are beyond my sphere of experience that have been some of the most interesting. Uh, the, J, the podcast he did with the historian and activist and Professor Jay Nickel was one of the most profound interviews we've ever published. Yeah, and that was, was entirely because of Brian Roth's awareness of a broader spectrum of people than I personally had uh, in that regard. And so when people talk about Brian Roth as if he's some clickbait writer, um, when he's writing 3,500 words on the history of inclusion in the, you know, through the Brewers Association and craft beer, and he's spending the kind of time he spent to get the story of somebody like Dom from Florida, who's a, 
uh, a black man who distributes yeah, beer down there I've who was about him. a third of that story that most mm-hmm. people don't even realize was in that story because right. they're so blind to it. Um, he got, you know, he interviewed people like Carla uh, Jantner, Jantner. Yeah. Um, Lauder. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Carla yeah, Jean that's Lauder. right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Carla um, Jean Lauder. Yeah. She's great. You know, about her experience and her experience has been long suffering and trying to get some of these things to be different. She was he, the one literally on Twitter when someone was like, why didn't you quote any women? And she was like, what yeah, up? I was, yeah. I was like, reading I was her, I was reading piece, her threads, like, <laughs> actually, because, you know, she's a very well known person in our yeah. industry, actually. Yeah. And she only seems through. to be getting more and more effective. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when people work. talk about Brian uh, as a human or as a journalist and thinking that he took shortcuts on that thing, it's mm-hmm. astonishingly out of sync with reality uh, for how much work and heart he put into that thing right. and how well I think he did it. Uh, there are some people out there that I guess disagree with what I would call the nuances of journalistic procedure on that piece. Um, I understand their opinions on some of it that I think the biggest one was that everybody we mentioned from a brewery that took part in this, this sort of exclusionary activity deserved to have their say in the article. Uh, I think, you know, as much as I respect their opinion on that, I think it's a made up rule. I think when you're citing a pattern of human behavior around something that creates a much bigger problem, our job is not to give voice to the perpetrators of that thing. Our job in that article is to give voice to the people who have been suffering from that thing. Their story is the one that's not being told, not the nuances of why somebody posted a fuckboys account. Um, I'm not interested in the nuances of that story as much as I am the effect of that story in aggregate. Yeah. Not other people. Yeah, and the other so, thing that we should well say said. too is that no matter what your opinion of the article was, a lot of the stuff that happened as a result of that posting of different personal photos and family photos and things like that is really unacceptable and yeah. should be condemned by everyone, really. Yeah, so that was sort of the fallout that I dealt with on a personal basis was that uh, I was not the author of the article. I was not the primary editor of the article. I weighed in on it a couple times along the way just as mm-hmm. a like, oh, have you thought about this thing kind of moment. Um, it was really Brian Roth, uh, who's not here, who, who did the lion's share of the work on that piece and had a lot of heart for it. And it was Austin who helped steer that thing to the mm-hmm. end. But ultimately what I think a few people who are very noisy, um, a few, uh, their agenda was more, I think about having a moment to take a swing at me personally as the publisher of Good Beer Hunting in their minds, uh, as somebody they maybe just don't like anyway, um, which is fine. There's some of those folks exist. Uh, I think they saw it as a moment or a crack in the shield maybe to come take a a good run at me personally because it otherwise doesn't make any sense to come after me personally. Um, They weren't disagreeing with the article. They weren't disagreeing with the topic. They weren't disagreeing with anything other than the fact that we were the ones that put it out there, uh, which is basically admitting that you don't have a reason. Um, That's just some sort of grudge. And that turned into people starting fake social media accounts with my name, uh, taking photos of my family, especially my children who are four and two years old and starting uh, Facebook accounts and putting their photos on there to try and pretend to be me and going after some of our clients or going after other people in the beer world, terrorizing other women and minorities who were trying to stand up behind that article uh, and pretending to be us, which was an abysmal, just a a vacuous human thing to do. Uh, Those are people who definitely just want to see damage done. They don't want to see the idea of them having to recognize their own complicity in a society that marginalizes these people is so terrifying uh, that they would go to that kind of a length to tear somebody down. Um, just such a it seems weird like, thing to stand up for. It I'm does seem like, like a weird thing. Like yeah, why this, would is, you this is where you draw the line. Defend that kind <laughs> like, of activity, even if you think, even if you think, even if you marginalize the activity and don't necessarily align with it, why would you still go to any length? Why would length you put like in that, that effort? Yeah. yeah, I'll tell you what though. I was prepared for it very well by uh, Shireen, who runs Healing to Action. I, before we published that, I talked to her a little bit about what her experiences have been online trying to right. write about these things. She no longer even writes about these topics. She's only quoted in articles from other journalists and other outlets. Because when she started writing about this stuff, uh, she would immediately get death and rape threats that felt very possible to her and just terrorized her life. Uh, So regardless of how ridiculous those couple of weeks were for us and how uh, just, yeah, how abysmal some of that activity was, it just doesn't compare to what I think the women minorities who take a stand on their own face. And I think... This is not a pat on anybody's back, especially mine, but I kind of, going back to what you said earlier, like as being the people who have created the system and benefited from it so long, and we are now in a position of responsibility to stand up for it and against it, uh, I think part of that is walking into the fray and accepting and being a shield for some of that and letting that happen. And just, you know what, for me, it was a lesson in just like, it's important for me to know what this feels like. Is that Even just, if I hate every second of it. Is that just the life of a publisher these days, given that these are the platforms that we have and how they're used? Yeah, you could talk about maybe some of the broader behavioral trends we have online for that. But I think around these issues, mm-hmm. uh, 
being threatened with severe bodily harm is yeah. not just internet culture. Uh, there's something wrong yeah, with people's back. souls movies, <laughs> at that point. You know. um, yeah, people really, they really hate a lot. That's wrong, man. That's crazy. I, I loved the, the the stuff that you talked about, about, you know, no matter what I, what I, what I get from a social media perspective, it, it, like you said, it can't be as bad as these people face on a regular basis. Correct. Right. Like uh, they're every day or as it is uh, involves around harassment. It can't even come close to that. And like you. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. You know, that's why I feel like it's our, our job and our goal to kind of take some of those arrows ourselves. Yeah. Because right. honestly, we deserve them at this point. I took a few weeks of I took a few weeks of hits uh, that created like a low grade stress or a darkness in my life that was hard to bear. I can't imagine walking into a place every day where I feel a shade of that just from being there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. The theme of uh, all the people that we talked to uh, in our series, I guess you would call it on diversity, was uh, the, the the real theme was have people in the tasting room that look like us or smell like us or talk like us or like just have people that represent it, th your your consumers in the tasting room. Like ultimately, that was like one of the biggest things. That, that was the pattern. Everybody said. Have 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 people of color, have women, have you know, we opportunities talk about community to embrace and beer, different types of community. Because mm -hmm. you think about your family and you know, everybody loves Thanksgiving because of everybody that comes on Thanksgiving is exactly the same. <laughs> right? Right. It's the exact opposite. It's like you hate Thanksgiving because all these family members with these different ideas, right? And it's only getting more difficult. You know, you got Gay cousin this, you got conservative uncle that, you've got, you know, and even still I'm stereotyping, but it's always, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're easy. They're easy to poke at. The only thing, Michael, the only thing you've ever done that made me want to throw barbs at you was the, uh, was the, uh, your take on the independent label, the seal. Oh, I'll yeah. Okay. For you. Cause <laughs> I'll agree with him there. And actually, I thought it was because ironic it like that when we the walked into the, the Porter Beer one. Bar, I noticed there's it. actually a label there that says something like Save proud, the craft. Yeah, save the craft. That's the it. only time I'm and like, I thought, this how ironic guy, is that? Man, because I'm that's the only you, thing that I really have been you just want to like, talk about I that disagree. Or? Let's talk I about it. Want, I do want to talk about it. I just want to know because it seems like you've towed kind of like the middle of the road on it. Like, it seems like the gist I have, and I would love to hear that I'm wrong, is... Something needs to be done, but this isn't it. Yeah, I saw it as a, boy, I think in the minds of the folks at the VA who are behind this, and it's not everybody, um, who, the folks who are behind it see it as a chance to grow the category of craft, but they only want to grow the category of craft that is aligned with their interests, which I understand. They're a trade group. That's what they're supposed to be doing. Right. What I saw from a broader consumer point of view is that they were taking up 13% market share. I don't think they've even hit that yet. Uh, and they're going to slice it and dice it even further down because now there's going to be people who adopt that. And then there's going to be people who don't adopt that. And all of a sudden they're going to look like they're not independent craft. They were basically putting out a reverse scarlet letter. And that was the, that was the consequence I saw. Right. Um, cause now you can be the smallest, most independent, most traditional craft brewery. But if you don't put that seal on there, you're going to suffer. Right. Uh, so it became a little bit of a mafia kind of play in my mind for like forcing people to tow the BA company line on something like that right. when they do not have that kind of alignment internally right now amongst their brewers. Uh, the people who were pushing the hardest on that were the larger sort of middle of the, the, the middle tier of craft brewers, like the dogfish heads of the world. Right. They can afford to change their labels. They can afford to change their labels. And they're also the ones that are the closest to not actually – living up to the standards of the BA label. True. Like the, the, where the financing comes from is important. Uh, the size of somebody like Sam Adams, he's like, they're on the cusp of losing their BA status. They might status. get bounced just because they make too much, too much cider. cider. Yeah. <laughs> so there's all, and so I think that seal does not, in, does not accurately reflect the lack of shared vision within the BA right now mm -hmm. to be able to put that as a stamp on a bunch of cans and bottles out in right. the market. Uh, and so I think, I think it was an inauthentic statement of vision I think it was divisive towards the brewers who are not going to adopt it, who will suffer from it. Okay. Uh, and then ultimately, I think all it does is swap out the word craft, which is still doing a great job of bringing yeah. consumers into a huge category uh, and slicing that down further into, well, not, that's, that's fake craft. You need indie craft. Better like, than at sour. At what point do people just be like, get out of my face? <laughs> you know, like I, they're just dividing yeah. things up so much because it's a, to me, it was a sign. It was a symbol of a protectionist mindset. Well, and I think like that's, 
immediately going to constrain the ability to grow the category. It's like a response. It seems to me like it's literally a response. It's a right total reaction. A reaction to the AB InBev purchase of a bunch of larger and really predominantly good artisanal craft breweries. Predominantly happened right after that, Wicked Weed. That, that yep. don't label it. Like that Blue Moon isn't labeled that it's owned by Sab Milo or Shock that Top. Shock Top or they don't know Wicked Weed. You know what Blue Moon's owned? doing better than any symbol ever could? Is they're putting something that is a craft beer in a place where people who don't normally drink craft will find yeah, it. Yeah, it's it probably the gateway. It was my beer. gateway, it still is. for sure. And, and, and not no. just gateway, just available, just mm-hmm. accessible. I'm just yeah, saying that airplane, there's this, like, this illusion exactly. of choice. I, I, this shelves. is what I'll say. Blue Moon, I, I hear what you're saying. Here's how I feel. It. Blue Moon is doing a bigger job than that indie seal ever could to create craft beer drinkers. And if that's the case, you've got a fucked up problem. <laughs> I hate it that I, I actually I your, probably I agree argument. with that. Actually, I get your argument again because I because I know my own personal thing. I didn't I didn't drink beer before Blue Moon, but well, there's probably a lot of other people who it's shock top, right? They're not seventeen dollar four packs uh, sitting on a grocery store shelf with you know wild labels that people. I think it also takes $16. it takes values that are internally valuable to the, or that have an internal value to the Brewers Association brewers, and tries to convince consumers that that's good for them too. And it's not necessarily the case. So I think if you're if no, you're a brewery, if you're that. a craft brewery, and again, I work for one, so I, I think about it from the marketing perspective yeah, of a independent lately. craft brewery. What they're saying is something needs to be done to differentiate that because if you look on a shelf at Target, you won't know the difference between a, a Henry Henry James hard soda and a and a unfortunately, you know, a creature comforts Athena Paradiso, right? I'm sorry, but if you can't tell the difference between those two things, then that seal doesn't matter. The thing I want, yeah, I want to know, like, there's like a, there's got to be a line somewhere. Like, pe- most people who are really into craft beer know if it's craft or not, right? And then a lot of people who don't care, don't care. Like, they're just like, ah, I'm just going to, this right. is fine, whatever, I just want an IPA. Like, and I don't know, like, who does the seal serve, you know? I guess the people in the middle, maybe? I guess, and but how many are there? And if it's like a little, like, if it's Wrecking Bar... Like you don't need to put that seal on. Yeah. No one. No one thinks that they were bought out by anyone. That's a local group. Like I'm, then it's like I'm trying to like. Well, I was just figure thinking. Out. Like I know that we have it on ours, right? So we we actually we we started putting it on our on our packaging. But I personally, I always feel bad now saying this. I haven't actually done a really good job of ex- communicating what this label means anyway. So our audience probably doesn't know what this means. Nobody right? has. Because I haven't exactly. done a very good job of communicating it. Which well, the breweries have to explain I it. mean, the Brewers Association put a marketing campaign behind it, supposedly to make it matter, and that marketing campaign was mostly about talking about Anheuser-Busch and giant checks and jokes. Oh, yeah. Was the just, what does that do stupid. for anybody? Well, that silly, fundraiser actually. thing to buy that was a waste and, of money. Was if I were, stupid. If I were a, and then people if thought I were it was a, a paying member, I would have been didn't. really yeah, pissed was, about where they were so using my for sure. money. And, and, this, and here's the thing. If, if you're a member of the Brewers Association and you take pride in that, which I think you very well should, putting, you know, expressing that through your packaging or in your tap room or whatever is just a statement about the values that your business has. And I think that's great. Like, I think people should do that. But that's not what this was about. Like, this was a recruitment tool to differentiate from Crafty. Basically, it was Craft versus Crafty 2.0. And so it's very much about what you're not. It was not about what you are. Because to this day, the Brewers Association has not explained why independence matters in any meaningful way to a consumer whatsoever. They can tell you why it matters to them. Right. But they haven't made it matter to the consumer. And that's where I think they're missing the boat. They 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 are taking this, you know, the slowing down. The, the growth is slowing. It's not shrinking, but the growth is slowing. We're five percent now, I think, uh, down from fifteen percent just a couple of years ago. Right. Um, when that's shrinking, doing things like this is only a tactical advantage on the way down. It is not looking to a higher level goal, vision setting, changing the world in a new way that is going to like increase the size of that category again. Um, I mean, what do they call that? Like, it's the uh, like painting the sides of the Titanic, or what is that phrase? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, right. oh, re- rearranging the lawn chairs yeah, on the Titanic. Yeah, yeah. Like that's that's what that kind of move says to me that that there is not a higher level strategy being played out because it's not connected to that. It's cosmetic. Um, it's if it was, analogy, if it but... was, if it was, if this was about pride and independence or pride and the Brewers Association, you would have seen people using the BA logo on their packaging before this. Nobody. I mean, did they that. could have just used the BA logo. The actual mark doesn't matter all that much. It's the intent, and that that was cloudy is. Is, yeah. is the gist of it. So I understand what you're saying. You know, most I don't think a lot of consumers know who the BA is, that they even exist. They just think it's probably a website yeah. where you leave comments and give caps. But 
they probably should seems to me they, they need to pivot and put the onus on the breweries to talk about why it's important that it's on their cans and then may pressure some of the smaller breweries to do something about it or participate like who knows what their participation is but i mean if really you ask is. if you ask most people why that why independence matters what they'll tell you is because we're not ab well some people are sensitive about giving their money to ab oh no that's you fine know. i don't mind anybody being like you know positioning themselves against ab in some way right. that's just not helpful to a consumer most consumers don't even know what ABI is. What's really fascinating about this, the more that we talk about it, is that coming from, you know, uh, we talked about this, but coming from the coffee industry where we have uh, Buku labels, certified organic, rainforest friendly, fair trade. There's so many, uh, they don't mean so anything. There's so many labels yeah. that consumers have no idea what any of these labels mean anymore. Um, you well, know, sure, and a roaster goes to Mexico and meets a farmer for the first time and then they put direct trade on their package. Yeah, direct like, trade or relationship. They don't have a direct trade relationship, you just visited. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if this actually fascinating to me i've never actually equated it to what what i deal with because now uh the brewery that i work for is now roasting coffee and we roast a certified organic fair trade coffee and and honestly the every time i type that out i realize that it's i don't i don't like typing it out and i realize that no one really even knows what that means sure and, that's my um, problem with this with this label is like i don't i think it only matters to the people who are obsessed with it right and so that's not making any change you yeah know? you're not like someone's not seeing it going oh that's the one i should get right exactly like they already they really wouldn't like, see this on a shelf anyway because this no. this does not the label right. is by the time you've picked up a can in your hand you've already made a but decision they're all spun around in the holder anyway yeah but still exactly if they don't know what that label is they're not going to take the time to like google it hold on let me see what uh, independent beer is right. i i do think that the idea is that we need to do something, right, to communicate what craft beer is and under, help consumers understand that the, you know, because Walmart is coming out with a craft beer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that they're contract they already have them, contract them. Uh, uh, obviously, Trader Kirkland Joe's has one. Mm -hmm. uh, Trader, Trader Joe's, Joe's, Aldi, they all do it. I will Trader Joe, but Trader Joe's specifically puts their brewers not all of them on their bottles. Not all for the most part. Petrus, they've used uh, Hardywood. Um, they've used actually some really good. Actually, some of their the beers that they private they always have are actually really good beers. Unibrew, uh, Unibrew. I think, still brews that that seven hundred and fifty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the Christmas, Christmas one sale. Yeah. They do every I used to year. buy that actually, shit by the case. It was like four dollars a bottle. You said Firestone Walker too, right? Uh, Firestone Walker used to yeah they used to private label a beer for Trader yeah, Joe's as right. well. I don't remember and which one it was. That wasn't my market. And your company does some creative work and for for breweries, right? Tons, yeah. That's yeah. I mean that's that's, that's our business. The core yeah. business. Yeah. So what do you tell your clients about the independent label? I don't tell them anything. If they want it, you put it. You <laughs> leave, do you leave it be? It's their brewery, man. I don't run the breweries. I just I'm I'm there as a brand consultant and and, and designer and packaging designer. Uh, if somebody, you know, we, one of our, one of our, one of the six brands that we manage has mm -hmm. it on their labels mm -hmm. and it was a matter of them saying, Oh, Hey, don't forget to put that indie label on there. And we're okay. We're like, we'll, we'll make it work. We'll fit it on there. Uh, the rest of them philosophically don't feel any connection to it whatsoever. Yeah, and it's never come up. Couldn't care all, less. They're all BA members. They're all BA members. Yeah. Yeah. They're all startup BA members. Interesting. Um, I just thought that. Though, I mean, that's the, that's the issue that the BA has in a much bigger picture way right now is how do you get that long tail of startup small breweries that are probably never going to produce more than a thousand barrels to give a shit about all this other work that you're doing that's not on their behalf necessarily it's on behalf of the largest craft brewers in the country yeah that's always been their issue is that the decisions that they make are very much the priorities they set are very much driven by the largest members which is going to be true of any organization like that i'm not trying to single them out as like somehow like backwards that's how that works right yeah you have to like you have to satisfy the needs of the the most powerful members that you have. I mean, even here, Jason bosses me around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah, so, so. Uh, yeah, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. No, I, I, I agree with you. And I think that, um, while the idea is that something needs to be something needs to happen, I think that I don't know if that's true. Well, I think the onus is on breweries know. themselves to tell their story and what yeah. makes them different. And as Just somebody like it does, is with coffee roasters, and I, and I, I th this will probably interest you. Is my, my position on it as someone who develops brands for breweries is I would rather have them telling their story than the BA story. I I agree with you wholeheartedly, and that's where I mean, like it, the onus is really on brewers to tell their story and yep. stay in their lane. And we talked about this earlier. And in a country with seven thousand breweries, I don't know if saying I'm an independent brewer means anything anymore. You're not right. different. You're one of seven thousand. Most of them are independent. 
Yeah. Well, if you're not really sh telling the whole story of who you are and what you do, yeah. and independence used to be an, it's not really going to matter. You, I, I think this is being driven by the emotional loss of the word craft doing all the work you needed for your brand back in the day. You used to just be able to say, I'm a craft brewery, and that's the only thing you needed to say, and that's why you were cool. It doesn't matter anymore. You have a lot more, you have a much higher hill to get over in terms of a story to matter to people when you're one of 7,000. People argue that craft doesn't mean anything anymore. It, of course it doesn't. I mean, people can use it, and people use it in lots of different ways, and it mm -hmm. matters in the way that they use it. I think that's interesting, you know? Yeah, the problem is when people may say craft and they mean good, and it's like, yeah, there's a lot of it that's not good, though. Yeah, like, there is a lot of there there is a craft lot, beer that's actually. not good. Right. We and drink so, a lot. Like, and a, those are probably the people using that indie seal more than anybody. And that's what's tricky. Yeah. It's <laughs> I like, like that independent in, means good. No, it doesn't. I like, like that. <laughs> the only place we talk about that is untapped. Like, other than that, nobody talks about bad breweries, bad beers. You never out anybody. And once in a while, on a local Facebook group or something like that. But yeah. even still, you get hammered. I mean, going back to that Boys Club article, that's a, I think that was a big factor in why that blew up in such a negative way online was because we culture, name names. You don't you're not name supposed names. to do that in, a craft, in the yeah, craft no, world. The well, it's such a small community, you know. Yeah. Uh, but we don't see ourselves as a craft beer website, which is what some people look at us as. Like, we see ourselves as writers and artists devoted to beer as a category. Like cultural. It seems yeah. like more of a cultural publication sure. than anything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, so I, so I, have, a, I have one remaining question, and that is, uh, this is something that, that I've read a lot, and this is something that I hear a lot, and so I, I, I would be curious as to know both of your thoughts on this, and that is um, the fact that, um, that uh, you guys are funded in some way, in some arms, by Big Beer. Uh, we talked about the, actually, you corrected me, on the Diageo, uh, the Diageo Guinness uh, sponsorship, I think. Well, mm, I don't uh, remember yeah. what I correct you on. Yeah, it's, it's all right. Uh, okay. I just thought it was, <laughs> you guys got a Diageo sponsorship, and um, and then there was like a big ad at the top of the, the, the Creature Comforts, mm. the article that Chris Heron wrote, which was a phenomenal article, by the way. I, oh, I, I do remember that now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay. Well, good. I'm glad you didn't remember it then. Mm -hmm. So, um, but... There are there are people that are incredibly critical of good beer hunting on the whole because there is some funding um, by either ZV Ventures, which is owned by Anheuser Busch, uh, ZX Ventures, ZX, yeah. ZX Ventures. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, well, first of all, it's not true. It's just not true. Uh, here's how that plays out. The only connection we have to Big Beer is that Goose Island has been a client for years on the brand side for our studio team, um, which Austin and our editorial team have no connection to whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, they run completely independently, and then we have. Um, the other one of our other bigger projects that the studio team manages, again, not the editorial team, is October, which is a magazine that is owned and operated by Condé Nast. Uh, it's done through Pitchfork. Pitchfork happened to be friends and neighbors of ours in Chicago. They wanted to start up a beer magazine. Uh, Condé gave them the green light. They recruited us to help them come up with the strategy behind that, talk about the beer, you know, beer audience of your category, what's missing from it, that kind of a thing. Uh, we helped. We helped the strategy and the creative element of creating that thing called October. And then they asked us to come on and actually run the editorial side of that uh, and a little bit of the strategy ongoing. One of the investors in that way back at the Condé level in New York, uh, which is the corporate level for dozens of magazines uh, from Condé Nast, is ZX Ventures. And when we found that and when we learned that they were going to become an investor in that, we put in a stipulation that they have absolutely no contact with the editorial or event side of anything. Uh, and that's been, and ZX has been very true to that for over a year now. Of uh, October, had, just to be clear. Uh, yeah, not just October, from October. Yeah, right. not yeah. Obviously, they have nothing with ours, but also nothing yes. with October. And Austin, you do most, is it, do you do most of the work for October? Oh, he doesn't know. No, I don't do anything for oh, October. No, <laughs> boy, did you have that. that wrong? Yeah, boy, did I get that one wrong? <laughs> no, <laughs> none fired. whatsoever. I'm fired. <laughs> no. Yeah, so, me see me after the show. So October is a client just like a Any other small client. brewery might be a client. Okay. Then yeah. I'm, then and, I'm... and for us, that's working with Pitchfork, where I had good friends. Creative director actually shared studio space with Good Beer Hunting for a while. So that was like a close personal relationship for us in Chicago. And so when we had the opportunity to partner with Pitchfork to create a beer magazine that was mainly geared towards mainstream drinkers, all the people that this independent seal is supposed to court, but, you know, like this seemed like the way to get people in there is like look at beer through the lens of music and sports and other, you know, and outdoors culture and all these other things that make beer kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Um, we saw a huge opportunity to like, yeah, let's go for the mainstream because Good Beer Hunting is such a nerdy, yeah, and like small. inside baseball kind of thing, you right. know? Uh, and I so this was it. a chance to reach a totally different audience with a totally different vibe. Um, so we did that with Pitchfork. Condé ran that from New York, but in a year, I had to think I had one call with Condé. Um, and then part of that investment, as we said, comes from ZX Ventures. And we were very explicit uh, once we learned that, when we talked about October, that like there has to be a disclaimer on every single page of that website that they're an investor, otherwise we can't do the project. Uh, when we announced that we were doing it, we mentioned ZX Venture was an explicit investor in that project. 
Uh, so we've been very transparent about all that. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, that still, doesn't touch our editorial team on GBH. That's a studio project. And that's why I asked the question, right? Yeah, because sure. it's definitely something that I've read a, a ton. And, and honestly, if I if I thought about it at all, you know, I kind of wondered it myself. Like what? I like, think that's totally fair to be skeptical, of that, that, which is why we thought it was important to mention that. And how does that affect? Because right. honestly, we don't we don't have any control whatsoever over who invests in that project. Like that can come from anywhere at any time, can change at any time for us. Right. It's not our say. We don't. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, it's the way that we still do. I mean, for what it's worth, we still do put disclosures on our editorial. Like if we write about ZX, because I just I want to like cut it off at the past, mm-hmm. where it's like, yeah. So you know, there's the ZX. Otherwise, thing beer over geeks here. will like tweet <laughs> right. you for yeah. a week. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. and all, all you have to do is be honest about it, and people are yeah. pretty. And the way that works is like you know, ZX invests a certain amount of money, which I don't have access to. I don't know how big of it is. I just know it's probably big. It's a lot of money. That goes to Conde. Conde pays Pitchfork. Pitchfork pays us for our role on that. Uh, so it's very valid to say that some of that money comes from ZX, not in any way that we are dependent on the relationship. My contract is not dependent on ZX liking anything we do. Uh, in fact, the we were the ones that exposed the ZX Venture had invested in rape beer six months without disclosing it. We were the ones that found out that story and broke it. And if anybody has a right to be pissed at us for any editorial we've done on the Good Beer Hunting side, it's ZX. Uh, in, and to their credit, it impacted zero of our you know, of our working relationship on October. Yeah. Uh, I, I all I can say is that ZX has perfectly respected that contract. Yeah. I, uh, so I, good on them. Yeah. For me personally, I know I know someone who has written for you in the past who I won't name, who I know is incredibly still supportive of what you do, and um, and his team have uh, have written articles for you guys, and so the fact that he still supports you and his company still supports you um, says a lot to me, right? It's, it says that they understand and get what it is that you do, and sure. they still back it on a. Re- I mean. We'll- Look at it this way. Every beer magazine has advertisements from breweries in their magazine. That's how they exist. Uh, so to say that we're somehow uniquely getting money from the beer world in a way that makes us biased is just fundamentally untrue. We're supporting our magazine the same way any trade magazine does. It has to stay um, open. Yeah. Well, it has to stay open and it has to thrive and it has to do good work. And we think we're making our way based on the quality of the work, not where the funding comes from. Uh, and I can say this also uh objectively that the percentage of revenue that we get from that project which is the only one that even has like a hop skip and a jump kind of connection to big beer uh is less than 15 percent of our revenues all the rest comes from small independent breweries that we're working on either on the studio brand side or the underwriters that we now have which is guinness new belgium and we're just about to announce Oma Gang. Um, so th- that's oh, our world. Did we just break news? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if that's man, news. Be, this, uh, this podcast will come out in a few weeks. So yeah, by then it'll be yeah, it's yeah. May one. It'll be all so news by then. You'll, you'll have brand um, new investors. And so those are the things that explicitly support the editorial side, and and, and we make that. I it's it's funny. We we often get dinged for somehow being this like mysterious operation that gets money from places you know like Big Beer, and we never talk about it. I have never seen an editorial outlet with the radical transparency we have about where our funding from comes from. If you know where our funding comes from, it's because we fucking told you. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> like, that's yeah. the only reason right. you didn't like dig it up on the deep web yeah, somewhere. It's on our goddamn about page. Yeah. Yeah. Right, um, right. So like when I, I don't know another magazine in any outlet, let alone the beer world, that when they bring on a new advertiser, they write an article telling you that they're bringing that advertiser on. That's true. Tell yeah. me one. I've, I've never seen, seen that before. I haven't seen an article in draft that says, you know, we sold the back page to Guinness and here's how it happened and why. Right. <laughs> it's crazy to me. But that's what you get for being transparent in this day and age is everybody's looking for some sort of conspiracy theory and they think uh, they're the ones that put it together on like that crazy board with the well, yarn connecting all the dots. Like we talked like, about no, earlier. Man, just, you, you clicked know, on about. That's what you did. <laughs> Social media just turning into this pitchfork mafia. Some yeah, of it's fine. a disaster, so. Not so, to be associated with the other pitchfork that we were talking yeah, about. Yeah, well, exactly. Which is a magazine. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> disclosure. Very Look at that uh, one. Michael Kaiser works with pitchfork. This is disclosure on top of disclosure on top. No, thanks. Uh, thank you guys for talking to us. Yeah, this has been great, honestly. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. This it's has fun. been incredibly it's fascinating, and um, it's been a good conversation to have. Uh, I think it's been it's been very it's been educational for me f- certainly and, absolutely uh, I, I imagine it will be certainly educational for a lot of people but um, but it's just been fun to have this conversation and talk about some of these things which are you know sometimes very two D uh, on social media great way to put it they become very three D whenever you're and you know you're mano and mano and so it was great to have these conversations and i'm thank you so much for taking the time to do it um i do want to mention we drank some beers today and we yep. usually talk about them as we drink them uh we're actually right now we're drinking uh tears for my hater yeah monday nights uh, tears, tears of my, of my enemies. enemies the yeah, imperial sorry, milk stout aged in scotch barrels with 
chocolate. Super good. Coffee, yeah, which is ridiculously good right now. I'm not Super a good. Scotch fan. It's really good. Really good. Um, I'm not a Scotch fan at all. This is the, this beer is incredibly delicious. Um, I like Scotch barrel aged beers though. There's no indie seal. Smoking it, I like Roush beer. So There's I no like indie seal on this. So I'm not sure. Yeah, Harper know, beer. It might change my opinion, opinion about this. <laughs> um, and then uh, before that, we had uh, Jekyll Brewing Secret Apollo as we were talking about small batch and how some of that uh, comes about. Before that, we actually had um, this is a Lone Pint Brewery from Texas's Yellow Rose Smash IPA, which is just a really good, it was really good IPA. I liked that one a lot. Uh, incredibly delicious bottle. And then before that, we had, um, which is what we started with, Central States Patsy, which I picked up the other day at a local store. It's an IPA with peaches. Uh, they're in uh, Indianapolis, and uh, and their client. And I should say, we yeah, full, uh, full disclosure. 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 Uh, I bought this separately <laughs> without knowing that they were a client of, uh, no, I of Michael's the business, episode, full disclosure. of his brand of business. Um, uh, but uh, I'm in your head, man. He's, you're he's, just buying the beers I exactly. want you to buy now. Uh, kind of seems like you're a shill for independent beer. I'm a, I'm a <laughs> shill for good beer hunting, and that means I'm a shill for finally. Z, for, was this blues. just one big good beer <laughs> hunting? We need one for exactly. so long. Shit, they got me again. This episode was brought to you by uh, no, I'm not. Gonna do that. <laughs> no, we're, but uh, we drank some good beers, and, and we I talked drank to, some Vita Coco before all. Of uh, that. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so we, we had some fun. Uh, we will. Uh, Let's we'll, do it again sometime. Yeah, yeah. We, we should Those do this, guys. We will. You're good fun. at this. We should. We should. We. Th- we this is our. Uh, we're probably. This year is our in? 16th episode. Yeah, 16th yeah, episode. You guys are good at this. It. Yeah, we're having a lot of fun with it. And again, for us, it's about talking about a lot of things that other people aren't talking about, and just uh, thinking about beer differently. Um, so we we talked to. a lot about branding and marketing because that's what we're both in. And uh, we, we talked about. Um, you know, uh, kind of... Next um, time when you're on, we'll just talk about labeling and brand strategy. Yeah, I would love and to my talk eyes about that. We've got an article about the, from a design perspective about that yeah. label we can talk about too. Yeah, yeah, yeah would, design, design, design. I will, I'm design. right in my ballpark. Got, yeah, so thank you guys for coming thank on. Thank you very much. Uh, sure. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Jason. I'll see you. See, see, see you soon, buddy. See you soon. Bye. Bye. If you have a question or something you would like us to discuss, drop us an email, sip at lastbeershow.com or hit us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook at The Last Beer Show. A reminder that we are proud members of the ABV Network. Go to abvnetwork.com to see all the amazing podcasts or go to your podcast app of choice, search for something like The Last Beer Show, Firewater Review, The Bourbon Daily, among others. And uh, if you really want to have a good time, go to Instagram and follow the hashtag ABV Network Crew. There's always all kinds of stuff happening on there, and it's a lot of fun. So anyway, thanks for listening. Peace. Oh, wait, wait, wait. One more thing. Please do us a solid and go to iTunes, rate the show. We would be extremely grateful. Thank you very much. Thanks again for listening.